Hello everyone and welcome to CramSurg, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we are going to have a look at a paper recently published in Annals of Surgery uh, entitled Is it safe to manage acute cholecystitis non-operatively during pregnancy? A nationwide analysis of morbidity according to management strategy. This is followed by another wonderful teaching session on survival curves by Professor Saba Balasubramanian. Hi everyone, um, my name is Johnny, I'm one of the new CTs at the Northern General at the moment in Sheffield. Um, so yes, today myself and Gio are just going to be presenting a paper titled, Is it safe to manage acute cholecystitis non-operatively during pregnancy? This paper is fresh off the press, um, being released this September um, in the Annals of Surgery. Um, I quite like it personally because it's a collaboration between the US and the UK um, and departments of surgery and obstetrics and gynaecology um, of the Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson University. So Gio, do you think this paper is relevant um, and why? Yeah, a uh, fairly relevant topic. Uh, first of all, Golston disease symptomatic uh, is a very common indication for non-obstetric surgery during pregnancy. Um, developing Golston in pregnancy is common uh, for both cholestasic uh, related reasons uh, and also because of the hormonal uh, imbalances that do change the composition of the bile. Um, there's quite a few examples in the literature of study looking at operative management of Golston disease in pregnancy and results have been a little bit inconclusive, uh, sometimes showing that um, there's an improvement uh, in uh, terms of maternal fetal outcomes, sometimes showing worsening. So it's good to see uh, a little bit of clarity, perhaps. It's worth mentioning that the uh, biggest American um, surgical society actually recommends cholecystectomy for symptomatic Gosson disease in pregnancy. And finally, uh, it's worth mentioning that the uh, American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists actually supports that recommendation um, regardless on the trimester of presentation. So, ball back to you, Johnny. Thank you. So, yeah, like Gio just said, um, the US guidelines do say that um, you, to treat women with acute cholecystitis in pregnancy with surgery. However, the paper hypothesizes that the majority of women with acute cholecystitis are actually treated non operatively and that this strategy is associated with worse maternal fetal outcomes. So they set out to compare maternal fetal outcomes according to management strategy for the treatment of this group of patients, um, and to also describe the current US surgical practice patterns um, and surgical outcomes nationwide for this population. Um, so Gio, if we were to put this study in a PICO format, how would that look like? Well, yeah, uh, patients uh, would be pretty much every pregnant woman admitted between, in this case, uh, 2010 and 2015 with uh, cholecystitis. Mm -hmm. You could argue that the intervention is um, surgical management or, or a cholecystectomy, which we will be calling CCY from now on. Mm -hmm. uh, the comparison group would be a non-operative um, um, management of cholecystitis. And outcome would be maternal fetal complications, uh, which we will uh, be looking at as a composite outcome. We will be describing that a little bit better later. Now, this is an observational study, so uh, PICO doesn't perhaps fit very well. However, it does seem to fit reasonably well based on um, what we described here. Uh, so, ball back to you, Johnny. Thank you. So, yeah, so this paper, they report themselves as a cohort study, retrospective cohort study. Um, so they started off with the um, outcome uh, exposure, exposure, sorry, and in this case being CCY versus non-CCY, um, and they set out to look for outcomes, and they got data from women starting from 2010 and followed them three times. Um, the way they got the data was using a national uh, database called the National Readmission Database, um, which is uh, basically a database having ICD codes for all hospitalized patients in 28 contributing states. Um, providing them with 36 million discharge data, discharges um, of data. And 
So they liked this particular database because um, it had a number of variables that make revisit analysis possible within the same state, um, essentially meaning that they could capture any readmissions, um, even if they did not occur in the same hospital. Um, they also liked the fact they had an ability um, to use weighting techniques to obtain estimates of patient samples, which we find um, we have some uh, problems with, but we shall discuss those a bit later on. Um, some of the codes they the, the codes that they used was cholecystitis, ensuring that it was non-chronic, so only acute cholecystitis, and then they also um, got codes for pregnancy. And then they looked for codes for delivery encounter. Now it was essential that these women had a delivery encounter um, because they used this to estimate the gestational age for these women because there was no delivery encounter codes on the database. Joe, do you want to explain to us how they uh, estimated the gestational age? Sure. Well, it's worth mentioning that they do not know what the gestational age of these women is. So what they do is they look at the delivery encounter um, and uh, how the delivery was actually labeled. If your delivery was labeled as a term delivery or a C-section, then your pregnancy, regardless on how long it actually lasted, is classed as a 40 weeks pregnancy. And they then look retrospectively when the cholecystitis episode happened and determine then whether that cholecystitis happened in the first, second or third trimester based on that. Uh, if your uh, birth was labeled as a preterm delivery, then uh, your pregnancy lasted 36 weeks. If your uh, pregnancy ended in a termination, then uh, they counted it as a 20 weeks pregnancy. Now, these are obviously estimates, and there's a few issues there that we will be discussing later on. Um, particularly, I want to highlight that it seems like in this paper, every C-section happens at term, and I'll leave that to that for the moment. Uh, Johnny, back to you. Yeah. Um, so then for the management codes, they used operative and non-operative. Um, for the operative, they uh, used col open cholecystectomy, lap coles, and also cholecystostomies, um, which we found a bit surprising. But again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there was no, they didn't specify what code they used for the non-operative. Um, and I didn't really find anything that they didn't elaborate um, in their paper either what they used um, for those codes for non-operative. Um, so Joe, do you want to talk to us through the outcomes, please? Yeah. Um, so as mentioned, the primary outcome they use is a composite maternal fetal complications um, that is looked at during the index admission. So the admission when the cholecystitis actually happened. Now, the variables that they include are uh, in this uh, fairly long list. Uh, so um, it's important to highlight here how they uh, look at these outcomes as a composite, uh, both crude and also uh, after correcting this using a propensity score uh, type of methodology. Uh, they do look at secondary outcomes as well. Uh, and those secondary outcomes are the same um, composite outcome, but at 30 days. Uh, maternal mobility variables, uh, particularly including cardiac complications and renal complications and a few more. They look at 30 days readmissions rate. And finally, they look at uh, the overall length of stay, both at the index admission and uh, in 30 days. Uh, ball back to you, Johnny. Yeah, thank you. So this is just a flow chart that explains how they got to their um, sample size. Um, essentially, the main thing to point out here um, is that they started off with about 282,960 patients. Um, they put the codes in and basically they excluded any patients um, who did not have a delivery encounter um, or ended an abortion because that meant they were, they were not able to estimate the gestational age. And any patient who had any missing data um, was also excluded from the study. So their final cohort study was 2000, sample size, sorry, was 2,719 patients. However, they used the weighting um, techniques of the database um, to estimate a national sample at 6,390, which basically doubled their sample size, um, which again, we'll talk about in the limitations uh, further. Um, so Joe, do you want to go through the primary outcome results, please? Uh, yeah, uh, very briefly, um, as you can see, uh, the composite primary outcome is significantly more common in the non-operative group, 27.6% uh, versus 8% uh, in the operative group. Uh, 
uh, with a statistically significant p-value and uh, a, a fairly significant odds ratio. Uh, unadjusted is 4.38, adjusted is a 3. Uh, if you do calculate relative risk here, uh, unadjusted, obviously, uh, that comes up as 3.4. Uh, um, a few more outcomes are worth mentioning here. Uh, poor fit of growth, uh, preterm delivery and C-sections are all more common in the non-operative group in this particular cohort. Um, and as you can see, the uh, odds ratios adjusted are um, quite significant there on the right side. Uh, Bob, back to you, Johnny. Yeah, um, and for secondary outcomes, um, essentially it was the composite outcome, so the, the maternal fetal complications, um, but 30 days on. Um, and the main thing to point out is that at seven point, out of the non-operative group, 7.9% of those women um, ended up getting maternal fetal outcomes compared to the 3.7 in the operative group. Um, odds ratio for that was 1.96. And the other thing they looked at with secondary outcomes was the 30 day readmission rate. Um, and as a cohort, the readmission rate was 15.7%. Um, however, the non operative group ended up having about 18.7% of readmissions um, compared to the 10.7. And of those readmissions, the non operative group ended up had 6.7% of these being planned. Now, the other thing to just highlight here is that of these planned admissions, in the non-operative group, 5.7 of those were for delayed surgery, um, essentially meaning that even though they had non-operative management to start with, the main reason for them coming back to hospital was to have surgery in the end. Um, and then just overall, the length of stay was uh, greater in the operative group. Now, there's a chart that she wants to go through, if you don't mind. Uh yeah, a couple of further relevant outcomes for surgical trainees. So as you can see in the top chart, uh, this is a depiction of um, how the operative and non-operative strategy was employed uh, in different trimesters. Uh, the vast majority of patients in the second trimester are actually managed uh, with surgery or cholecystostomy. Um, and this is kind of expected based on the traditional teaching that in the second trimester performing surgery is easier. Uh, or at least less risky uh, for uh, maternal fetal outcomes. Um, the chart at the bottom highlights uh, what different surgical strategies were employed to treat these patients. And as you can see, the vast majority of them actually had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Uh, a minority had an open uh, cholecystectomy, which is most common in the third trimester. And this is for ergonomic reasons related to the difficulty of performing laparoscopy with a big uterus. Uh, and there's a fair amount of percutaneous cholecystostomy performed here. Um, I have some doubts in terms of the way we would handle this um, in the UK, meaning that we wouldn't routinely offer a percutaneous cholecystostomy unless the patient was sick, or we just decided that surgery was not an option for them. Mm. So it might be a little bit confusing here. Uh, ball back to you, Johnny. Yeah. So in terms of the limitations, we'll start off with the self-reported ones. Um, and one of the main limitations uh, they mentioned is related to the use of the administrative data. Um, so the analysis basically relied on diagnosis and procedure codes. Now, everyone who's worked in a &E or even in the wards knows that sometimes you don't always have the right code for the diagnosis that you want. So um, it's really hard to kind of um, just check if this, this, coding, this coding was actually accurate. Um, and the data also had mainly, so the database only had inpatient data. Um, so any patients who presented at, as outpatients for anything um, would not have been picked up um, as possible um, representations. The other thing as well is for the gestational age, they didn't have any codes for gestational age. So they had to estimate that using the delivery encounter. So this basically means that any patients who did not have a delivery encounter automatically excluded from the study. And in their results, um, you see that most of their patients um, were actually in the third trimester. And one of the reasons they mentioned for this um, is that it's due to the fact that these women were more likely to be followed up until their delivery or termination encounter in the same calendar year. They also, there's some confounding variables um, that they were unable to control for, for example, race um, and other socioeconomic determinants. Um, and these could have driven either delayed hospital representation or increase the likelihood of these women representing um, so readmissions um, or basically if these women were not able to afford um, post-discharge care that meant they would come to hospital a lot more um, but yeah 
do you, do you want to talk about the limitations that we found? Yeah, so uh, one thing that I found particularly puzzling, I already mentioned this, is that they counted every cesarean section in the database as a 40 weeks term delivery. And we know that that's definitely not true. Um, in the States particularly, uh, in the early 2000s, we had uh, nine out of 10 premies being born via cesarean section in some hospitals. So probably not the best strategy in terms of estimating gestational age. Um, I want to make some further points about the estimation of gestational age because they do not make those points in their limitations. Um, so doing, using this type of methodology to estimate um, how far um, the patient is in pregnancy can introduce further biases. Um, just think about the risk of intrauterine death between 38, 39, 40, 41, and 42 weeks. These are all term deliveries, but the risk of intrauterine death is very different throughout these four weeks. And there's no way that they can correct for that. Um, I do have a question more than a point, and that relates to the use of weighted representative samples. Now, as we mentioned, <clears throat> this particular database that they use, the NRD, allows uh, the user, uh, starting from a specific sample, to estimate a nationwide sample uh, based on that. Um, now, this is designed for the purposes of estimating the risk of the admissions, the reasons for admissions for uh, particular uh, patient populations and planned services. I'm not sure that this data can be used to estimate the prevalence or the risk of relatively rare outcomes, such as intrauterine death, to mention one, um, without using some sound statistical methodology to correct for that. And again, I don't have an answer for this. I looked for it. I couldn't really find it. And finally, um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we did calculate some relative risks um, uh, unadjusted, obviously, uh, in this case, and we found them to be um, lower than the odds ratios that the authors uh, describe. And this uh, is kind of expected, obviously, mathematically speaking, but uh, maybe we should use relative risk here rather than anything else. Um, uh, Bob, back to you, Johnny. Yeah. So, so the conclusion, some of the conclusions they made is that most pregnant women admitted with cholestis, acute cholecystitis were managed non-operatively, which is contrary to many clinical guidelines in the US. Um, and associated with that is increased maternal and fetal complications, specifically um, preterm deliveries, C-sections and the poor fetal growth. However, the good thing is uh, most of these who were managed operatively did undergo laparoscopic cholecystitis which is in line with the national guidelines. Um, so yeah, and the table just there is just to kind of summarise all the points we've just made. Um, but yeah, thank you. Obviously. Thanks. Right, so we'll talk about measures of risk, the final uh, part. Uh, so for those of you who have not come across the earlier versions, um, they're all there on the website and on YouTube. It might be worth your while um, looking through parts one to three and um, because um, we're going to skip over the basic concepts and go on straight to um, time to event data. Right, um, a couple of slides on what we learned before in parts one to three. We talked about um, odds ratios, relative risks and attributable risks as uh, commonly used measures of risk. We talked then about relative risk reductions, absolute risk reduction, and number needed to treat. Um, and uh, we then moved on to time to event data. So when we talk about time to event data, we mean uh, not just the event happening. Uh, so we're interested in not only whether a specific event that we're interested in happens or doesn't happen, like for example, death, or a wound infection, or a recurrence of a hernia, for example. But we're also interested in when that event happens. You know, does it happen uh, early on um, during the course of uh, follow-up, or does it take many, many years? Because obviously, uh, that's important. That's quite important as well, as you can imagine. We, in the last part, talked about what hazard ratio means. Hazard ratio is a risk measure used for time to event data. It's very, very similar uh, conceptually to relative risk, and it compares time to event data in two groups. So 
we're now going to move on to talking a little bit more about time to event data. So let's just take survival as an example, um, which, which is essentially um, whether somebody has survived a particular sort of disease um, uh, or not. So how can we describe survival? We can either describe survival as a percentage of patients surviving at a specific time uh, period. So you could say uh, following treatment of, let's say, colorectal cancer, 90% um, survived at one year. Um, you could say 74% survived at three years, or you could say even smaller percentage survived at five or 10 years. And that's a useful um, way of uh, depicting to clinicians and to patients, you know, what the survival chances are. You could also look at survival slightly differently, and you could say, you know, 50% of the patients in your cohort lived um, for up to six years. So there you're talking about median survival. And again, you could say what the lower quartile was or the upper quartile was, or you could say 90% of, of patients survived X number of years. So there are these different ways of talking about um, survival. Uh, so you, you're talking about survival at a specific time period, or you're talking about uh, the number of years a particular proportion of your cohort survived. To describe or present all of the above, we use a survival curve. So we'll talk about survival curve in the next two slides. Right, so here is a typical survival curve. This is a kaplan meyer survival curve. Uh, I've got this data from uh, my PhD from many, many years ago. Uh, you've got the survival of patients with grade three breast cancer plotted on this graph. So on the x-axis, you have time to um, a specific endpoint. Here, this is death or metastasis in months. And on the y-axis, you have the probability of people surviving. So right at the top here, and I'll try and show you here, right right at the top, at the beginning of the study, if you like, uh, you have uh, all of your patients being alive. And then as time goes on, you have patients um, uh, dying or developing metastasis or, um, over time and the y-axis gives you the probability uh, of surviving at a particular time point. Okay, so there are lots of YouTube tutorials on um, how to create a survival curve and also explanations on uh, how you interpret survival curves in a lot more detail than we have time for. So I'll try and um, give you a, a bird's eye view of uh, what we ought to sort of um, um, learn about survival curves. So um, these curves show proportion surviving um, without the event happening over time, just like I explained. And, and, and you've got to keep in mind that the event does not have to be death. So a survival curve could be anything. It could be occurrence of a hernia, for example, or reoccurrence of a hernia after repair, for example. Uh, but they're all called survival curves. All of these time to event data uh, are uh, typically called survival curves. And sometimes the event can be a composite event, like either death or metastasis. So uh, any event that you're particularly interested in, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be death. Uh, survival curves usually take what we call censoring into account. So what's censoring? And uh, you, you probably have heard this word um, in the context of um, survival analysis. So censoring occurs when a patient drops out of the study for a number of reasons. The patient could have left a, the, 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 um, uh, your area and migrated to another country or another region and you don't have any data. So that date of migration or moving away from the area is taken as a date at which you censor the patient, which means that you accept that you do not have a, um, data beyond that point in time, and you know that at that point in time, they have not had the event. Another uh, example of uh, censoring could be if you're looking at um, a patient who's died of, say, a road traffic accident after being enrolled in your study for um, a specific treatment for grade three breast cancer, and you have said that the, uh, you're only interested in events that are directly related to breast cancer, or in other words, deaths from breast cancer, 
um, and they've, if they've died of a road traffic accident, then you, at that point in time, say that they are censored. So that would be another good example of censoring. A third example of censoring would be that if, if you have done a study over a 10-year period and you have recruited a patient in year nine, and then you've got just one year of follow-up and you've completed your study, and that at one year, the patient obviously um, is still alive, um, and you do not have data beyond the year because you're stopping the study, then again, at one year, that patient would be considered to have been censored. So a number of reasons why censoring um, can occur. Now, survival data is usually presented using non-parametric methods. And the reason for this is that uh, you do not need to make any assumptions about the distribution of the survival times. So yeah, and you may know that for some diseases, um, the survival um, in the first few years after the occurrence of the disease uh, might be low in that many patients might die very early. And then once they've survived beyond a certain point, um, then their um, chances of continuing to survive goes up. And in other diseases, it might be the other way around. So if you employ non-parametric methods, then you don't have to make any assumptions about how the survival um, uh, is distributed or how the events are distributed over time. So that's a kind of typical sort of conventional thing to do, describe survival using non-parametric methods. And there are a couple of important assumptions uh, that you've got to keep in mind when you're looking at the survival curve. The first is that the censoring is independent of the event. So uh, patients migrating or dying of other causes, um, those events should be independent of the event of interest, i.e. dying of breast cancer or getting metastasis from breast cancer. The other important assumption is that the probability of survival is independent of the start times. And this is very important and often um, not clearly understood. So what I mean by this is that if you're including patients in um, your breast cancer study, for example, um, for over 10 years, then you've got to um, make the assumption that patients getting enrolled into your study in the first two or three years, they, uh, their prognosis, their survival, uh, is the same as patients getting into your study in the last few years of the study. Because if treatments have changed dramatically during your study and the prognosis changes dramatically because of changes in treatment, then you really shouldn't be looking at the survival of uh, this entire um, cohort accrued over 10 years. I hope that makes sense. If not, come back to me uh, during questions and I'll explain this again. Right. So that's the kaplan meier survival curve again in a cohort of um, grade three breast cancer patients. So that's the same curve that we've seen. You've got to keep in mind that there is another type of survival curve called the actuarial survival curve. Now, in kaplan meier survival curves, each time an event happens, you um, plot or you calculate the cumulative survival. So let's say you've got a couple of deaths occurring in a very short interval of time. At that point, you uh, calculate the, your cumulative survival and then you carry on. And then when a death occurs again, you calculate your cumulative survival again. So each time an event happens, you work out the probabilities and you plot them on the graph. Well, you don't do them physically. You have lots of different software that can do this for you. Contrast this to an actuarial survival curve. Here what happens, you've got this uh, so actual survival curve on the same cohort of patients plotted on the graph on the top right of your screen. Here the cumulative survival or the probability of you surviving is plotted or is calculated at specific time intervals. In this particular graph, we've done this every year. So every year you calculate what the cumulative survival is and then you go on for another year and then calculate what the cumulative survival uh, is. So the main difference between what we call actuarial survival curves and the kaplan meier survival curves is this. In the actuarial survival curve, you plot the probability at fixed and regular time intervals. In the kaplan meier survival curve, you plot the survival each time an event happens. Now, the good news is that in most of medical literature, we use kaplan meier survival curves. <laughs>
But I thought it is important for you to just keep in mind that you can plot survival curves in two different ways. Okay, now let's just move on to something that I think um, is probably a little bit more interesting. So not all survivals are the same. What do I mean by this? Now, when you're plotting a survival curve and you're talking of survival, median survival and what have you, you've got to be careful about what you mean by the event of interest and you've got to define it very clearly. So when you say survival uh, and death, uh, you have to understand what you mean by survival or death. You might find that strange, but what I'm trying to say is you've got to talk about um, if death is your event, you've got to look into what is um, the cause of death, whether you're interested in death from any cause or whether you're interested in death from um, the specific disease you're interested in. You then have to decide a priori when to censor and decide on what events to ignore. Now, if you take the example of, say, um, colorectal cancer, um, and I've shown you, I've shown you this uh, little table here, it might appear a little bit complicated, but I'll explain this table. You can see that survival can be defined in a number of different ways. And this table has been derived from, uh, has been extracted from a systematic review that looked at how survival was defined in a number of colorectal cancer trials. And you can see here that um, they have on this in this table at least six uh, different ways in which survival has been defined. So let's just look at a couple of them and then hopefully it'll make sense. So OS, OS stands for overall survival. And here um, the end point is death from any cause. So if there's death from the same cancer or from another cancer or there's a non-cancer related death or a treatment related death, you consider that as an event. So it doesn't matter uh, what they died of, if they've died, that's an event. If they just had disease recurrences or they had a second cancer, then they're all to be ignored. Those events are to be ignored completely. Uh, obviously, there's loss to follow up, then you censor them. So, so if you um, uh, are interested in overall survival as your endpoint, then this is how you define your events of interest. You decide when to censor and you decide what to ignore. Another example um, at the other end of the scale is what we call disease-free survival, DFS. You probably come across this in a number of, uh, um, on a number of occasions. Here, Disease-free survival um, means that you're interested in either death from any cause or recurrence of the disease or recurrence of um, uh, you know, the colorectal problem. So if you had recurrence or distant metastasis or a second colorectal primary, or if you've died from colorectal cancer or any other death, you are interested in it and you classify that as an event of interest. Um, if you lost a follow-up, then you're censored, and you're not really ignoring um, any uh, death from any cause um, or, or um, whatever recurrence um, uh, related to the cancer um, happens. You know, you're not going to ignore anything. So, so you can see how disease-free survival and overall survival differ. And then if you're interested, if you have time, you can come back and look at uh, what recurrence-free survival is, time to recurrence, time to treatment failure, and cancer-specific cancer survival are. Now, um, I, I'm generally interested in cancer-specific survival as an end, end point, and also sometimes in disease-free survival. And they are actually quite different. A lot of people um, assume that disease-free survival and disease-specific survival are very similar. But actually, they're not. So if you have time, you come back and look at this chart and you will find that um, the events of interest, the censoring and the events um, that are ignored are quite different between disease free survival and disease specific survival. OK, so why does this matter? Now, let's just take uh, these um, two extreme examples, overall survival and then disease free or disease specific survival. Now, clearly overall survival is going to be influenced not just by the treatment of the cancer, but also by other factors such as toxicity and chemotherapy toxicity, for example, associated morbidity and age. 
Whereas disease-free survival or disease-specific survival is going to give you a more accurate reflection of the efficacy or effectiveness of the treatment. So that's an important difference. If you look at objectivity, overall survival, which is essentially saying death from any cause will be an event, is pretty objective. So you can't argue about death or um, being dead or alive. However, if you look at disease-free survival or disease-specific survival, it is not very objective at all. And this is um, one um, area in cancer epidemiology that people tend to get uh, a little bit perplexed. If you say to them that the disease-free survival is not a very objective measure, uh, you might find some eyebrows being raised. But essentially, what you're saying is, depending on how frequently you're going to screen for disease occurrence, let's say colorectal cancer, you've, you've um, given a specific chemotherapeutic regimen in your cohort of patients, and then you want to follow them up. And if you decide to screen them every three months, as opposed to every two years, survival, then you might get the numbers you need and the uh, events happen a little bit sooner and you could finish the study relatively early. Right, so we come to the learning points. So we talked about time to event data and we talked about how time to event data is usually best presented as survival curves as opposed to just saying median survival or X percentage at five years or so, and so. And Kaplan-Meier curves and actuarial curves are the two ways in which you can present a survival curve. Kaplan-Meier curves are the ones that are commonly used in medical literature. And uh, just remember that in a Kaplan-Meier curve, at every um, point or time um, period an event occurs, you calculate your probability of survival. Um, it's important to think to think about the endpoint in some detail. You know how do you define your event? What can be considered non-events, and um, when would you say censoring occurs? So when you're critiquing a paper with survival data, or if you're doing a study, by, um, uh, if you are conducting a study, it's important to think about these endpoints. And uh, there are a number of different endpoints. I showed you a, a sample from colorectal cancer literature. There are about six or seven different endpoints. They all have slightly different utilities and um, are of value in, in different contexts. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>